So we are here on Tuesday, March 1st, and again, our member meeting and speaker series, and we're going to have a couple more for this season. And as I mentioned, I am a board member with Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And again, I just want to welcome everyone and thought I'd toss up a, a lovely, lovely photo of a a tree swallow. Uh, they'll be arriving later in March and hopefully they will do really well. Um, but we are looking forward to spring. Um, I certainly hope people are keeping an eye on the news. Um, you know, we always hope that the world will be a better place. And I just hope that, uh, you know, things will be resolved uh, around the world. Alrighty, so our March bird quiz answers. Alrighty, so temperate grasslands like those found in North America are distinguished by, well, I'm gonna flip back to the four selections. We had their open areas with grasses, large number of grazing animals, and high amounts of rain, that's one choice. The second choice, frequent fires, large numbers of grazing animals, and large open areas of grasses. That's a second choice. Third choice, low precipitation or rain, rich soil, and diverse shrubs and trees. And choice D, poor soil, meerkats, and year-round snow. Hmm, 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 hmm. All right. So the answer is they have frequent fires, large numbers of grazing animals and large open areas of grasses. I think that was B. I don't know why an A showed up there. That's not right. Maybe A for answer. How about that? But yes, uh, temperate grasslands do thrive on having fires go through periodically. Uh, large numbers of grazing animals, anywhere from bison and elk to prairie dogs, insects, uh, and then of course, large open areas of grasses. How many of you got that one? Yay! All right, very good. No mere cats here in North America. And the state bird of Colorado is, ta-da, the lark bunting. And the provincial bird of Saskatchewan is the sharp-tailed grouse. Oh, I sure hope I got those right, Tim. And just for your information, here's what a lark bunting looks like. A very good grassland species in Colorado. And the sharp-tailed grouse, again, a wonderful grassland species in Saskatchewan. Yay, love them. All righty, uh, I did want to bring up that yes, our, the spring bird walk series, which is in the, this will be the 89th year that the spring bird walk series have uh, are going on. And uh, they are, you can see Sundays, April 10, 17 and 24. So the last three Sundays of April and the first three Sundays of May, first, May 1st, May 8th, and the 15th, and they start at 7.30. There are a couple of sites that have some different uh, start times. Um, these take place in Cuyahoga, Geauga, Lake, Medina, and Lorain counties. There's a number of organizations that are participating with the Spring Bird Walk series. Uh, the ones that Western Cuyahoga tends to um, advertise the most since it's in our area are Lake Isaac and the Big Creek Reservation, uh, the Rocky River Nature Center, of course, that walk around, around the uh, Rocky River Nature Center, um, Hinkley Reservation and Brecksville Reservation, which is the Station Road Bridge, which also encompasses part of the Cuyahoga Valley. Of course, we highlight spring migrants, and we encourage novice birders, beginners, kids, experienced birders, everyone is welcome. I just wanted to show you the list really quickly of the locations. Um, the location list and additional information will be on the Western Cuyahoga Audubon website. And a number of these other organizations will 
put them up on their websites as well. So you can see the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland, the Aurora Sanctuary, uh, Bedford Reservation. Uh, I highlighted the ones that we tend to uh, talk more about since they're part of Western Cuyahoga Audubon territory. Um, there are various locations in Gates Mills and you have to call for details. Uh, the Geauga Park District participates and there are various locations there. Uh, Hinkley Reservation, I mentioned earlier. Uh, at Hiram College, the uh, field station, the James Barrow Field Station has a hike, Holden Arboretum, uh, Lake Metro Parks and uh, the Lorain County Metro Parks are participating with Cascade Park in Elyria. And that's at 8.30 in the morning. So that one's a little different time. Menor Marsh, uh, North Chagrin Reservation. Um, that tends to be more of the, the East Siders. Uh, Novak Sanctuary, again, part of the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland Properties. Uh, the Ohio and Erie Canal Reservation, uh, the Canalway Center, uh, as I mentioned, Rocky River, uh, the Nature Center at Shaker Lakes, the Shaker Lakes Hikes, and Medina County uh, does them on Saturdays, uh, and that's at River Sticks Park. Uh, and those are slightly different dates, of course, since they're Saturdays. So there's actually four uh, Saturdays in April and two Saturdays in May. All righty, Michelle, um, glad to have you here. Thank you. Next slide, please. All right, so oops, I'm, I'm going to cover our second Saturday bird walks, virtual field trips, Tremont Towpath, Trail Urban Bird Walks, Woodcock Watches, and how you can connect with us on social media. Next slide, please. All right, so please join us the second Saturday of every month for our second Saturday bird walks. The next one is on March 12th at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dunninger, Dave, Dave Grass Kemper, and Ken Gober are our leaders for the walk. Next slide, please. All right, this past second Saturday was held on February 12th, and here is Bill Dunninger's report. He says, uh, the second Saturday bird walk had 24 observers. It started with a brisk temperature of 27 degrees and ended at 28 degrees. It was partly sunny with a mild occasional breeze. Unfortunately, the trails were very icy and we had a limited walk. We only made it to the end of the nature center and had to turn around. We tried to walk on the all-purpose trail, but had multiple patches of black ice. We then went to the nature center and watched the bird feeders. Highlight was a nice pileated woodpecker. Uh, also, we had 20 morning doves feeding under the bird feeders. Next slide, please. All right, the February virtual field trip. Last month, our virtual field trip was held at Rocky River Reservation. Our target species were the Northern Cardinal and Tufted Titmouse. The virtual meetup during which I will present the scrapbook of everyone's photos, journaling, and bird list takes place the second Wednesday of the month, which means it is taking place on March 9th at 7 p.m. If you visited the location and have something to submit to me, please do so by this Friday so that I can get your items into the scrapbook. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit the reservation last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the Zoom meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. Uh, please register at Eventbrite. If you are on our email list, you will receive this link in our weekly emails. And I will also put the link in the chat once I'm done speaking. Yeah, All right, I'm just gonna slide. pipe up here too. This is Nancy Howell. I, I try to do as many virtual field trips as possible. Um, you don't have to do the field trips. Uh, we'd love to have you uh, do the trips, but if you don't, uh, that's okay too, because the meetups are wonderful, The where we talk about what was seen and take a look at photos. And it's just, it's just really exciting. So again, we hope people can join in uh, either attending the field virtual field trips, doing the uh, meetup, or both. All right, thank you. Uh, and next slide, please. 
All right, this month the virtual field trip takes place at Big Creek Reservation in search of migrating waterfowl. I have listed several sites I think might be good, including Lake Isaac, Lake Abram. You can walk the Lake to Lake Trail if you wish, uh, Fowles Marsh, Snow Road Picnic Area, and Bayers Pond. However, you can visit any site in the reservation. And during your visit to the reservation, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. Take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen. Tally identified species or journal your experience. Send your items to me and your contributions will be published to a scrapbook and shared on our website and, and on social media. Uh, we will also have an optional Zoom meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can register for the meetup on Eventbrite. Again, watch for a registration link in our weekly emails and I'll put it in the chat. And I just wanna point out that um, our, our photo captions are cut off for some reason, but this photo was taken by Tom Fishburne, a wonderful photographer. So happy to have his, his photos for um, some of these slides. All right, next slide, please. All right, again, another lovely photo by Tom Fishburne. Um, so please join us uh, the fourth Saturday of every month for the Tremont Towpath Trail Urban Bird Walks. We are running these walks through October this year. We meet at the Cleveland Metro Parks parking lot on Abbey Avenue, just west of Sokolowski's University Inn. From there, your birdwalk leaders, Nancy Howell and Al Rand, will guide you north through the Scranton Flats area of the towpath. The next walk is Saturday, March 26 at 9 a.m., so be sure to mark your calendar. This past Tremont walk on February 26, we saw a northern pintail, American coots, canvasbacks, redheads, lesser scalps, buffalo heads, and hooded mergansers, to name a few. Our best highlight for the walk was observing two peregrine falcons mating and displaying in and around the nesting box on the Hope Memorial Bridge. Uh, this nesting box hasn't been used since 2017. Chris Saladin reports that this peregrine pair nested at the Voinovich Bridge last year. Is right, this photo is this photo from uh, the past Saturday? Yes, yes. yes. That's this is Tom Fishburns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. I remember that pose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great fun. All right, so our popular Woodcock watches are back for a second season. Uh, they will run every Wednesday from March 30th through April 27th at 7.30 p.m. We will be meeting at Main Street in Strongsville at the railroad tracks halfway between Eastland Road and Big Creek Parkway. Nancy Howell once again lead this event. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, registration is required for this event as we will cancel for inclement weather, so please register so that you will receive our communications. Uh, the planning for this is so new that I don't believe we have an active registration on event right yet. However, please watch for details in upcoming weekly emails. If you don't receive our emails and would like to, please send us a note to info at wcautobahn.org and we'll get you on that list. All right, next slide, please. All right, finally, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded like the speaker series meeting and our virtual field trips that I mentioned and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel. So please be sure to subscribe. And I believe that's it for me. Thanks so much, Michelle. Sure. Lots of information. All righty. Uh, Drina Nemes is not able to be with us this evening, but uh, we do want to point out that the next book in the book discussion series is The Feather Thief, and the event will take place on Tuesday, April 26th, uh, from 7 to 8 in the evening, and uh, we'd like you to register for this. Um, you can check out the book at a library, whether a hard copy or audio book uh, or electronic format, or if you wish to purchase, or maybe, maybe a friend has a book that can be borrowed. Um, but it's really a, a very, very uh, interesting and true story. Uh, you wouldn't think in this day and age that things like this could happen. But it is a, a crime. There were crime committed. and. Um, it, I don't want to give it away. 
it's going to be fun. So we hope that you can join us for a feather thief on Tuesday, April 26th. And of course, it's not too early to start thinking about planting. And Western Cuyahoga Audubon has, uh, works with tilth soil. Um, this is soil produced through a company called Rust Belt Riders. Uh, it's a Cleveland company. They take food scraps from households, from businesses, and turn them into wonderful uh, composted soil. Um, there is a couple of different varieties. One is called Sprout, and that is for seed starting um, and also all-purpose type of soil. Um, uh, the house soil is for house plants. And um, I think there's, yeah, Grow is for plants that you are putting out in your garden. So it's like a supplement when you're transplanting your tomatoes or peppers or things like that. Um, it is on our website. You can order large bags, or I have, we have a couple of small bags uh, already in hand and can be delivered to you tomorrow if you're interested. Um, you can uh, contact uh, us at info at WC Audubon if you'd like to have more information about the Tilth Soil or check out the website. And of course, it's always ice cream weather. We still have a couple of gift cards. They are $10 denominations for Mitchell's homemade ice cream. Um, don't get them for Valentine's Day because that's over with, but how about St. Patrick's Day? How about Easter? So we do have a, a few cards left if you're interested. They can again be delivered to you directly tomorrow. Uh, so uh, again, if you're interested, please let us know. You can check out the uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon store as well. And Amanda Sobrowski is our coffee coordinator. Amanda is going to chat with us a, a bit about our wonderful birds and beans coffee. Take it away, Amanda. Thanks, Nancy. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the folks that ordered last month. We um, had a pretty successful month. Um, and I wanted to say thank you because they, by purchasing coffee, they help support our mission, as well as helping to improve the uh, habitat for birds in Latin America. And at the same time, helping the growers to um, get a, a make a living wage um, when they raise the coffee sustainably. Um, you can see from the page that orders are due the 10th of every month and they're sent out within a week from the company. They're pretty responsive. And then we try to hand deliver them within a day or two after um, I receive them, they come to me. Um, I wanted to point out this little blurb that we have two bags, they're five pound bags of dark roast coffee, whole bean, and you get them for the um, bargain price of $50 because they were ordered, they were sent to us by mistake. So we have them on hand. So if you want um, dark roast whole bean coffee, um, we can deliver it to you within a day or two. Um, as you see, the orders are due every month on the 10th. And that's all I have to say. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Amanda. Yes, please. It's great coffee. And uh, I think on our uh, e-blast that we send out, Amanda even puts some delicious uh, uh, recipes. So that's always fun too. All righty. So I do want to mention that next month uh, on Tuesday, April 5th, we have Dr. Laura Rocket. Oh, I always, I know her by the last name Rocket. Rocket Tenets, who is the manager of the University of Akron Field Station at Bath Nature Preserve. And Laura has been phenomenal in connecting people and nature and birds. And uh, uh, a field guide was created for the Bath Nature Preserve. Um, and it's just, uh, just a lot of fun. 
Um, plus, of course, she likes to get uh, everyone involved, uh, people of color, um, people that are uh, perhaps have a little less income, uh, all kinds of folks, uh, again, can be birding and enjoying that uh, field station at Bath Nature Preserve. So we hope we, you can join us uh, again Tuesday, April 5th. Of course, it, we're at 7.30 and uh, we'll see you then. But this evening, yay, we have one of our own members, Tim Colborn. Uh, who will be speaking, of course, as you can see, the grassland birding in Colorado and Saskatchewan, a birder's retirement gift to himself. Uh, Tim uh, is the president of the Ohio Ornithological Society. He, oh, just a few years ago, retired from a banking uh, job and said, I'm going to head out west. Uh, of course, he visited uh, some other folks as well while heading out west uh, and but just took the time to really enjoy the birds, the, the wildlife and the areas uh, out West. So uh, this evening, let's welcome Tim Colborn. And Tim, I am going to stop sharing and you can begin sharing. How about that? Terrific. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Let's see if it'll switch over. Okay, looks like we're we're on our way. Nancy, thanks for the nice uh, introduction. I appreciate that so much. Um, a uh, long, long time member of Western Chicago Audubon, and um, happy to have a chance to actually give back uh, in a little way tonight. Um, you know, Nancy called me. Uh, we had a conversation anyway. I think. Actually, we bumped into each other birding and we carried on a conversation about me perhaps uh, providing a presentation to the group. And I thought about this trip that I took uh, well, about three and a half years ago. As, uh, as Nancy mentioned, I had just retired from a, a long career in, uh, in banking and uh, I had some time uh, and I'll get into that in just a moment. But before I start uh, more deeply, I just wanted to make a couple of quick disclosures. Um, the purpose of the presentation, I think, besides uh, sharing, is, is to inspire folks to think about um, uh, long drives as a way to um, not only get to locations to bird, but to bird along the way. And um, it's a very interesting way of birding. And uh, many of us have done that, of course, within Ohio. Um, but taking a long trip. Uh, like I did, um, was a, a lot of fun. And um, one of the reasons I did so was so that I could start seeing birds, um, the Western birds, the birds uh, typically found west of the Mississippi and um, uh, even uh, different birds once uh, one gets uh, toward the Rocky Mountains. So maybe you'll be inspired in some way to think about doing such a trip. Um, the other the other uh, uh, disclosure I wanted to make is, you know, those photos that we saw from Tom Fishburn were absolutely stunning. Uh, I do not claim to be a good photographer. I am a photographer, but I'm not a good photographer. I use um, a zoom point and shoot uh, camera. Uh, I get some pretty good documentation shots. Um, and, but um, I hope you at least enjoy looking at the photos as part of uh, sharing my experience. Um, so I, as I said, I was recently retired. I, um, I wanted to visit some, um, former colleagues that I had in Colorado and more importantly, an old, uh, childhood friend who lives in Saskatchewan. Um, when we were children, um, we both spent our summers in the Eastern townships of Quebec. And she and her brother, me and my brothers, we hung out all summer long for um, our entire childhood. Uh, and we remain friends uh, uh, to this day. Um, uh, my brother had visited her. I thought it was my turn. So um, those two uh, visit uh, plans combined with this idea that, geez, maybe I could go out and do some birding out west. Um, 
was a strong part of the impetus. I had also purchased a new car and I sort of wanted to break it in. So yeah, all these things combined to, to get me over the hump and say, go West young man. And you can see here that I, I formed a, a plan in my head. Well, I'll head out to Colorado. Uh, from Colorado, you know, I'll, I'll spend some time with, uh, with uh, um, a couple of former coworkers, you know, maybe have some meals, break some bread. And then after uh, some time in Colorado, I'll head up to Regina, Saskatchewan, the capital of Saskatchewan and visit my friend Diana, and then see if Diana wants to go spend a few days bird watching. And luckily she did. So we, uh, we spent four or five days in Saskatchewan birding, and then uh, I headed home uh, toward Winnipeg, which is due east um, from Regina, Win uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba. The, uh, the uh, Manitoba is the province just to the east of Saskatchewan. And just before I got to Winnipeg, I jogged down through North Dakota, Minnesota, et cetera, all the way back to Ohio. Uh, I planned the trip from May to June, May 21st to June 2nd. It was about 13 days. Uh, and even though this was, in my mind, was really a grasslands trip, uh, I'm not going to go through Colorado, um, Boulder, and Denver. I'm not going to go through those without stopping. Uh, to do some birding in the Rockies. And so that was part of my plan. The Pawnee grasslands are just to the north and east of Rocky Mountain National Park. And, uh, and then there were several grassland parks in Saskatchewan that uh, I wanted to visit. So here's a, a, a Google map of the general route that I took. Uh, you can see here I am uh, North Olmstead, uh, took I-90 all the way out um, through Nebraska, through the heart of Nebraska. I jogged down here into Northwest Kansas and then over toward Colorado Springs before heading north up to Denver and Boulder. And I'll explain why I did that uh, later on in the presentation. But uh, you can see sort of over here on the left is Rocky Ma Mountain National Park. And then this dot over here on the right is Pawnee Grasslands. As I said, I spent some time there and then zoom, I headed north. Um, you can see a stop here in northern Montana, the Medicine Lake National Wildlife Refuge, and then up into Regina. And then the time in uh, Saskatchewan, I'm sorry, over here, Regina, um, you can see that we did a little loop, Diana, my friend Diana and I, um, to a, a, a migratory birding area uh, called Old Wives Lake, then down to the uh, small town of Val Marie. Uh, which sits just outside of, Sisca of uh, Grasslands National Park, which is a Canadian national park, not just provincial. And then to uh, what I think perhaps is the most interesting name of all the Nature Conservancy properties I've ever heard of, Old Man on His Back Plateau. So um, uh, that was our final birding stop. And then we routed back to Regina and I headed back home. And uh, you can see that route that I just described a moment ago. So I, uh, I departed Ohio early in the morning of the 21st. I wanted to get to uh, Colorado in about three days. So essentially two full days of driving. I wanted to arrive in Colorado early on the third day. And my intention was to bird along the highway while I was driving, kind of, kind of keeping an eye out on the birds that I was seeing. But I, I, I intended to make a few stops that were lengthier than uh, just say a, a quick uh, a rest stop or a, a stop for a bite to, uh, for food. Uh, and I had hoped to start seeing true Western species on the second day. Uh, so on day two, I, um, I did encounter, uh, I started to encounter some, some Western birds. Now white pelicans certainly are not uh, truly uh, Western birds only. Um, they are regular even in uh, the the uh, left half of Ohio. We, we have them as a regular um, uh, species in this state. Uh, but um, as I kept moving west in Nebraska, I, I saw truer Western species. Now, Eurasian collar dove is another bird that, that shows up in Ohio in, in relatively small numbers, of course, but, but it's, it, it is a bird that is um, expanding east. But I typically think that as a bird of the South and a bird of the West, 
Um, Bell's vireo, another bird that shows up in small numbers in Ohio. Uh, I saw this bird, those, both those birds, as well as a large cliff swallow, swallow colony were uh, seen at the Crane Trust in Wood River, Nebraska, which is, uh, Wood River is the heart of uh, the Platte River area, uh, where, which is famous, of course, for its um, a large uh, massings of uh, sandhill cranes in the spring as they as they move north, and that Platte River Valley can hold um, six, seven, eight hundred thousand uh, sandhill cranes. Um, now I was there well past the point at which they were moving through, but um, if you ever have a chance to go out to see the cranes in their uh, migration, it is truly a sight. But we stopped, I stopped this, as I said, at the Crane Trust to do a little birding and was beginning to, to get a taste of some of those Western birds. And then a little further West in Elm Creek, I saw my first Western Kingbird. And to me, that is one of the birds that signals uh, the fact that I have really started to move West, uh, that I'm getting out uh, into the West. And I saw that bird, I started to see Western Kingbird along um, the highway and the agricultural uh, properties that are always driving along. And um, so I, I felt like I had finally made it west here um, mid to late day on the second day. Um, as just a little further west, I jogged south into northwest Kansas. And in Norton, Kansas, near what is called the Prairie Dog State Park, I saw and heard my first northern bobwhite of the trip. Northern bobwhites, of course, um, uh, more numerous out there in the heartlands. And in, uh, I've got a couple of photos finally. Uh, here's uh, one of the Western kingbirds that I stopped and uh, took a photo of along the highway, that beautiful lemon yellow uh, belly, that soft gray head and, and back with the, with the darker wings and tail. Um, I think it's all, always to me an elegant bird. And here's a black-tailed prairie dog at the uh, said uh, Prairie Dog State Park in Kansas. Uh, Nancy and I had a, a quick chat about these dogs and we're discussing the fact that um, they share habitat often with burrowing owls. And uh, uh, I tend to believe that um, both those animals look out for one another in some way as they keep their eyes to the sky uh, for potential aerial predators. But uh, black-tailed prairie dog was fairly numerous at the state park um, along with some of the Western birds that I've described. So um, one of the things that happened to me while uh, I was planning the trip, just a, a few days before I was planning the trip, I heard a report um, of a Colorado first state record bird that showed up at a place called the Michik Ranch, two hours east of Colorado Springs. And so I, I said, you know, hey, it might be worthwhile trying to take a shot at that bird. Hope that it's still there, uh, a migrant that was well out of its range, and uh, I said, I'll, I'll take a shot. Um, so the, the, that morning, I think I stayed uh, not far from Norton, Kansas, and I, I woke up and uh, started driving further west toward the Mitchick Ranch, and I started seeing more and more of these Western species. I start, saw my first Swainson's hawk. I started seeing the lark bunting, one of the birds that I associate so much with uh, Colorado. And um, uh, thank you, uh, Nancy, and your quiz for pointing out that it is the state bird of Colorado. Uh, just a terrific, um, just a dashing species, uh, that, that male. Um, and I was seeing lots and lots of Western meadowlarks and uh, I saw my first burrowing owl of the trip. So here's a, a Western meadowlark. Uh, they were uh, numerous on the fence posts um, on my drive west toward this, uh, toward this rarity. And I was on some dirt roads um, at some point uh, driving relatively quickly, but I was able to you know, kind of keep track, uh, at least in my head at that time, of uh, all the Western meadowlarks I was seeing. And I, you know, another Western meadowlark, another Western meadowlark. And then I, 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 I was driving perhaps a little bit uh, too fast, um, but I, I, 
I drove by a bird that just didn't look quite like a Western meadowlark uh, sitting on a telephone, uh, a fence post, excuse me. And um, I, I stopped, backed the car up, and this is what I saw. It was a burrowing owl on a fence post, again, just off the side of the road, um, trying to, uh, trying to uh, fake me out as if it were a Western meadowlark. Um, but I was surprised at seeing um, that bird after uh, many, many Western meadowlarks that it was very near the size of a Western meadowlark. And uh, it was a real treat to be able to get that comparison. So here was the bird that was in, the, in uh, uh, that area at Michik Ranch, a golden crowned warbler. Uh, now golden crowned warbler is um, a, 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 a rarity even down in Texas where it is seen now fairly regular and regularly. In fact, there has been a bird since at least November uh, in West Laco, uh, Texas that has been seen by many, many folks who have gone down to the valley to, uh, to bird since then over the winter and here as we, as we walk toward uh, or move toward early spring. In fact, as of yesterday, I believe that bird was still being seen. And while I couldn't confirm it, uh, records on the internet and on um, Facebook suggest that, um, that uh, warbler crown, uh, golden crown warbler uh, nested there, that, that someone suggested that uh, a, a young bird was seen and has been seen uh, through the winter there. So I, I can't confirm that information, but um, all that is really to point out that um, that bird down in West Laco is rare because of the duration of its stay. Um, Golden Crown Warbler uh, does show up there in Southern Texas, um, but uh, it rarely goes further north. I believe there's one record uh, from New Mexico and one from Louisiana, at least on eBird, and, um, and it doesn't typically go further north. So this bird was well north of even its uh, normal vagrancy range. And so it was a really nice treat to be able to see this bird and add it to my life list. Um, got, got to the Mitchick Grants, was there with um, a dozen other birders uh, who waited about an hour uh, before this uh, bird finally showed itself. I would have loved to have gotten a photograph myself, but uh, this bird was a skulker moving through a thick hedge of a, a shrub I, I wasn't even familiar with. And I apologize, I don't have the name, um, but uh, terrific, but brief looks at the bird for probably 15 or 20 minutes as it moved back and forth uh, around a, an area, perhaps the size of an eighth of an acre and got several brief, but, but good looks at it. So it was qu quite the thrill and, and, and really kind of a nice um, jumping off point as I hit Colorado and started to bird in what I thought at that time was uh, for me the true west on my trip. Um, later in that day, on uh, the third day, I, I got to have lunch uh, with one friend and, and grab beers and a, a quick dinner with another friend. Um, so, so I was able to spend some time with some of the folks that um, were my colleagues at KeyBank. Um, and then I, I, uh, I found a place to stay in, in Boulder, <clears throat> excuse me, and I had in mind a canyon trail um, <clears throat> just on the outskirts of Boulder, uh, a trail called the Bear Canyon Trail. And for those of you that maybe have visited Boulder, you might be familiar with it. It's, a, it, it's really a, a trail that sits on the edge of the suburb itself, but then climbs up into uh, this, uh, this mountainside. And um, it is really, truly a, a, just a, a beautiful walking trail and not, not too difficult and very, very birdy. At this place, I, I had spotted towhee, magpie, um, broad-billed hummers were displaying and doing their, um, I think they do kind of the, the J or the half U as they loop back and forth. Uh, and lazuli bunting, um, both trips that I've gone to this uh, canyon trail, I've had lazuli bunting. Uh, which is just a, a spectacular Western species. So I, I spent um, uh, about an hour, hour and a half uh, on the Canyon Trail. And then I, I made my way north up to Rocky Mountain National Park, which is uh, north 
west of Denver, but, but mostly north of Denver, uh, a couple hours, and started to see some of the northern species up there, um, or I should say the, the species that, that are often associated with higher altitudes in the mountains, Stellar's jay, violet green swallow, mountain bluebird, uh, red nape sap, uh, western tan, blackhead grosbeak, mountain chickadee. So all these birds that I really associate with the Rocky Mountains and, uh, you know, it, it, it was really, really beginning to be um, exciting. Um, and, and I saw a lot of mammals there too. You can see this long list of mammals. I've got some photos uh, here. This is the Bear Canyon Trail in Boulder. Um, and if you were able to turn um, this photograph 180 degrees backwards and look behind me, you would see uh, a suburban area, um, kids riding their bikes on a street not too far from here. Um, but on the left here, as we look up the canyon trail, you can see the, these trees and shrubs dotting um, what is underneath there, uh, a narrow stream. Um, but the, the combination of this edge habitat and the water really provides a magnet for, for birds. So uh, as I was saying before, I, um, I uh, between uh, Boulder and uh, my first jump into Rocky Mountain National Park, I added black-billed magpie to uh, my list. Um, I am a big fan of corvids, and this is such a, a very um, bold, looking bird. Uh, it is like its, uh, like its cousins, the crows, a, a very boisterous and um, uh, very assertive bird. Um, I just love that color combination of the, the black, white, and blue. Uh, so here's a, a photo that I took that day in Rocky Mountain National Park. You can see that there was plenty of snow up uh, probably somewhere at the eight, 9,000 foot level up there in the mountains beyond. Um, but yet down uh, further below, um, probably in the 5,000, 4,000, 5,000 foot level where I was, it was um, very, very comfortable, um, well up into uh, the 50s, maybe into the low 60s, sunny, um, just beautiful. and. Um, for any of you that have been out to the Rocky Mountains and particularly Rocky Mountain National Park, you know that photos like this are not unusual. Um, there's just gorgeous vistas almost everywhere you look um, and uh, just a spectacular uh, scenery and um, uh, lots and lots of space uh, and beautiful birds. Uh, here's a Western tanager that I saw that day. It was um, under a canopy of uh, a tree and in, in the shade. Uh, and this bird, for some reason, sat in the same place for 15 or 20 minutes. I, I didn't want to get too close, so this photo is taken a distance. But um, as I was uh, birding off a parking lot in the park, um, I got to kind of keep my eyes open around the parking lot and uh, an adjacent trail all the time with this bird keeping me company. Um, I, I did see black-headed grosbeak in the park that day, but the photo here is from a grosbeak that I had at a feeder um, right outside the park at a lodge that I stayed at. Um, it really was just outside the park within a mile, I think, of the entrance. And uh, I, I saw a lot of birds and I'll, I'll share a, a brief list in just a moment, but, but this one landed right on the feeder and I just uh, couldn't resist getting a shot of this beautiful male black-headed grosbeak. I did mention that I, I saw some quite a few mammals and um, I just took a couple of uh, shots here um, uh, to share with you. This is a, a golden mounted, mantled ground squirrel, golden mantled ground squirrel. Um, this is a least chipmunk over here on the right. Um, and these are, are just a very adorable birds. A, a, a little bit of a larger um, a rodent here is this uh, Richardson's ground squirrel. It's a, it's, it's, it's a little chunkier, a little bit bigger, um, while the golden mantled ground squirrel is um, just slightly larger than the, the uh, chipmunks that we, the Eastern chipmunks that we have here. This uh, Richardson's ground squirrel is, is, is much larger. Uh, 
two terrific birds of uh, the higher altitudes on the Rocky Talus slopes in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park. This is the American pika. Uh, it is a lagomorph. It's related to our um, our our rabbits here in the east, the the, uh, the eastern cottontail. It's a it's a relative of that animal. Um, and um, these guys uh, squeak and uh, scramble around on the rocks. And just occasionally, one will pose for you like it posed for me here at, in this beautiful bright light. And I got uh, a photo of this adorable little guy with his uh, cute round ears. Uh, there is one other pika in North America, the collared pika, but that's uh, seen further north and west um, up into the uh, northwest provinces of Canada and into Alaska. The bird down here, or the animal down here, down to the right, is the yellow-bellied marmot. Um, and uh, some of you may have uh, be familiar with that name from um, a, a phrase used in an old uh, Bugs Bunny cartoon. But the yellow-bellied marmot is a uh, is a very very interesting looking uh, mammal. Um, Again, lives on the in the same kind of habitat as the pika. It's a uh, it's a much bigger mammal um, with with a very kind of stocky build, and um, you know very interesting colors. Uh, at first glance, it looks simply like a dark um, brown or black animal, but as you you get a look, you you see that orangish yellow uh, chest and belly sometimes, and um, and you see some of those subtle color differences in what is a very, very thick coat and kind of that big blocky head. I always find the, the marmots to be very, very interesting animals. And uh, the, the marmots are, are not difficult to find on a, a sunny day up at the higher elevations of Rocky Mountain National Park. This uh, animal up on the top left is of course an elk. Uh, you can see the, um, the soft velvet on its uh, antlers at this time of year. Um, I never was able to get any close shots of elks um, with the sun behind me, um, but I like this shot because I can see I can see the softness of that velvet on its antlers. On the bottom right are some very very light colored young bighorn sheep. Uh, at this this photo was actually taken from the lodge uh, where I stayed. Behind us um, were the mountains and. Uh, I had arrived, unpacked my things, uh, stopped outside to sit and watch the feeders and uh, some neighbors at uh, an adjacent cabin um, noticed that I was wearing binoculars and said, hey, would you like to see some bighorn sheep? I said, absolutely. I said, turn around. Well, I turned around, put my binoculars up on the mountainside and there were four or five of these beautiful animals uh, uh, a little bit up uh, and I got my scope out and shared closer looks with the uh, with the two of them. Uh, I was just dumbfounded that I could see these from from my cabin and, and watched as they walked along the, the rocks up there and rested um, for probably an hour. It was really uh, a joy to see them. So uh, on day five, I, I woke up and uh, spent a little more time looking around the property. Um, as uh, as I mentioned, it was just outside the park, so I'm I'm still right in the Rocky Mountains um, on the property and at the feeder. Uh, well, on the property itself, I had a bush pit, bush tit, um, a small group of bush tits, as is very common with that species, moving through um, uh, very quickly. Kind of, you know, all I probably had a group of eight of them, kind of diving into some shrubs feeding there very, very briefly and quickly, and then moving together again as they uh, shifted across uh, an area that I watched. Uh, pygmy nuthatch, which is another expected bird in the Rocky Mountains, uh, and uh, Cassin's finch, which uh, is a, a close relative, of course, of our house finch and our uh, purple finch, uh, but it is bird of the West. And I made my way up to the Pawnee National Grasslands on the same day. I, uh, I had about, I, if I recall correctly, about an hour and a half, two hour drive up to the grasslands. And I, I added some new trip birds this day, a couple of birds that in my mind had been almost mythical. Uh, the chestnut collared longspur and the thick-billed longspur, formerly known as um, McCown's longspur. 
Um, these two birds um, were birds that uh, I had not seen in over 30 years of bird watching. And um, so for me, it was a real treat to see these birds um, uh, who I, you know, uh, birds that I really wondered if they, if they truly existed. So uh, I am here to tell you that they do exist if you haven't seen them and share in your joy if you have. Uh, other grassland birds that I saw uh, that day were harrier and more burrowing owl. Loggerhead shrike was uh, fairly regular there. Uh, a bird that we see here in Ohio regularly, the grasshopper sparrow. I saw that bird in good numbers. More lark buntings, more western meadowlarks. Uh, it was uh, really a joy to be driving through the Pawnee grasslands, one of the largest uh, contiguous prairie grasslands, remaining prairie grasslands in the country. Here's a photo of uh, a, a, a breeding male uh, chestnut collar long spur with that, uh, that black breast and belly. The, uh, you can see a little bit of that chestnut along the neck and that uh, yellow, yellow shoe on the face with the, with the white. Um, a, an absolutely striking bird. And these two long spurs um, that nest here in the grasslands uh, at Pawnee um, don't share the exact same habitat. The chestnut collar long spur is a, a bird of the, of the taller grasses. And um, you might be able to get a sense of that from this photo. Those grasses are you know, probably six to 12 to 18 inches. Um, this bird has found a, a, a perch on a, a, a small a plant looks like thistle. And, um, but it likes the longer, the longer grasses. The thick-billed long spur is a bird of the shorter grasses. And uh, you can see here the grasses that it's uh, walking through on the, in this uh, poor photograph are uh, probably only two to four inches. Uh, makes it easier to, to find them, but they, they are skittish and move very quickly. Um, I don't believe they're as numerous as the chestnut collards. And I had a, a, a tougher time uh, finding these birds. While I'm fairly certain I saw others, this was the only bird I was able to confirm. And that nice uh, black line from going back from the bill uh, demarking the, uh, the face, the gray face and the white throat um, was uh, helpful in identification. Here's a photo of one of the grasshopper sparrows that, uh, that I saw. Um, I had many chances to, to photograph this bird and, and uh, it, was, uh, it was accommodating. Uh, just for me, one of my favorite birds um, from um, the Colorado, Wyoming area, um, uh, just so handsome, that black and, and white on the wings. Um, well, I didn't see uh, any flocks of, of these birds. It was in breeding season. So there were certainly many pairs that I saw. Um, I have been in Wyoming uh, in migration to see you know, somewhat large flocks of this bird together. And uh, it, it's a, a, a true sight. But the, the lark bunning seemed to be ever present as, uh, as I drove through the Pawnee grasslands. Um, very, very active, both males and females. This is, of course, the male here. So uh, I stayed somewhere uh, north of the Pawnee grasslands uh, at the end of day five. But on day six, I started driving up through Montana. I got north of Wyoming and into Montana, into uh, the prairie pothole region of, uh, of Montana. And, um, you know, we tend to think of prairie pothole uh, of the prairie pothole region as being the Dakotas uh, primarily. And, and I think there's a strong argument to suggest that that may be the heart of it, but the pothole region really expands uh, beyond the Dakotas. And um, in uh, Montana, I was uh, driving north, got to um, Highway 16, um, probably somewhere, uh, I, I think it was actually in the southern half of Montana that I got onto Route 16. But I was seeing many, many ponds and lakes um, either right adjacent to the highway or not far from the highway. And so I was seeing so many water birds. I was seeing lots of, you can see this list of pelican, both teal, um, mallard, shoveler, 
pintail, gadwall, scop, uh, ruddies, uh, eastern grebe or ear grebes rather, yellow-headed blackbirds, um, uh, avocet, uh, stilt sandpiper, marbled godwit, Wilson's phalaropes. I, I saw um, many ponds with multiple phalaropes, so sometimes as, as many as a dozen and a half phalaropes in some of these ponds. And uh, it, was, it was just very difficult to keep driving and not to stop at uh, just about every pond I passed. Uh, so at the uh, later in the day on day six, I stopped in uh, northern Montana at the Medicine Lake National Wildlife Refuge, and it is just so wonderful in spring migration. A, a beautiful refuge that I encourage anyone who is out in that part of the country to uh, try and find some time to spend there. Uh, again, lots of waterfowl and shorebirds. Uh, and blackbirds. If you like blackbirds like I do, uh, boy, you, you'll get an eyeful there. Um, all three of these Western uh, grebe species, Eared, Westerns, and Clarks were present at Medicine Lake and um, all the expected Western um, Ictrids, um, red-winged brewers and yellow-headed blackbirds, um, bobolink, Metalark and grackles. It, it was just uh, wonderful. Uh, these two uh, birds up here on the top left are uh, eared grebes. You can see that uh, beautiful um, uh, breeding plumage on uh, on this bird on the top. And then on the bottom right here, for um, for those of you who um, who may not remember the differentiator between Clarks and Westerns, uh, it's Clarks grebe that has the uh, the black over the eye rather than through it. And so that this is a, a Clark's grebe. Uh, I made my way um, further north and got to um, got to just below the uh, Saskatchewan border. And um, I made a couple of stops and then uh, eventually got myself over the border, and I wanted to stop. Um, and uh, I guess I really wanted to start my Saskatchewan eBird list, <laughs> so I stopped to see what birds I could I could find. And um, this red fox kit uh, came into view uh, in a field that was adjacent to a little parking pull off, and was scampering around. I, I kept looking for uh, its um, its parents. Um, but uh, never did see it. Um, uh, this, this animal was, um, I, I'm, I, I'm making an assumption based on a, a relatively smaller size and um, uh, uh, facial features that I, I appeared to me as being not fully uh, mature, that this was in fact a kit and not a full grown adult. It was scampering around um, looking for uh, what had to be rodents in this, um, in this field that had been, um, that had, had been used for agriculture, but um, didn't look like it had been active for some years. Um, I never did see any other red foxes on the trip. Um, the other um, thing that happened to me at this spot was I saw uh, a, a potential um, life bird. Unfortunately, it was not alive. Uh, what I assume was a, a bird that had been hit by a vehicle nearby. Uh, this gray partridge was the first gray partridge that I have ever seen. Um, uh, and uh, I was uh, I was saddened to see uh, its lifeless body there, but um, at the same time marveled at this amazing plumage. Um, just a, a beautiful bird, um, even in this uh, this repose. So uh, I was uh, determined to see this uh, uh, bird alive and well in uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, as I as I continue to move uh, 
toward Regina, the capital, I encountered this storm. Uh, it was interesting. There was blanket clouds above, the sun was heading down, and you could see these rain spurts coming off those, that thick blanket of clouds. Um, before the sun dipped down, it had been much, much darker, but the sun actually came below the clouds and lit up the undersides of the clouds. It was one of the most interesting climate events that I've ever seen. So I got in that night, uh, day six to Regina, uh, visited with my friend for several hours that evening and, uh, and then decided after all the driving I had done, I was gonna take a little bit of time. So my friend Diana drove us to uh, Wascana Marsh, which is a small park in the city of Regina. And um, we just had a nice leisurely walk. And um, uh, soon after that, I think we, we drove around uh, the city a little bit. And uh, it was just, it was just really a day of rest. So I saw some of the, the common birds there uh, that we would expect uh, in many uh, parks here in Ohio. You know, I saw, I saw my first uh, Canada goose from Saskatchewan, for example. And there were several other uh, waterfowl species there at the park, as well as, uh, uh, you know, very, very common birds like uh, American robin. So here's our plan for uh, when Diane and I talked about getting to see some of the grasslands in Western Saskatchewan. Here, here was our plan drive. We were gonna drive out to, toward Old, Old Wives um, Migratory Bird Refuge and spend a little bit of time there. Um, but our ultimate destination on this first day was Val Marie, which is the town just outside of Grasslands National Park. And we were gonna, bird a full day plus in Grasslands National Park before we then headed out to Old Man on His Back, uh, the, the, the Nature Conservancy uh, property in what is almost the uh, far Southwest corner of Saskatchewan. And uh, along the way, so my, my friend Diana uh, works for the park services out in Canada and uh, she studies uh, or has studied large mammals primarily. Uh, she did uh, studies of lynx and grizzly bear uh, in the Canadian Rockies. And I think, she's, I think she studied a mountain lion. But at the time I visited, she was doing research on badger. And so one of the uh, hopes that we had was that we would uh, seek and find at the very least uh, badger dens on our trip in some of the grasslands that we would be at. But we crossed our fingers and hoped that we might have a shot at, at seeing uh, badgers. So our first stop was the Old Wives Migratory Bird Sanctuary where we had a nice flock of Franklin's gull. I saw my first clay colored sparrow of the trip. And uh, we had Ruddy's turnstone there too. Now there were there were other birds, but I'll, uh, I'll try and keep it brief as I, I move through here. I've got some other photos I'd like to show. Finally did get great partridge just outside the Grasslands National Park on later in that day. Uh, Grasslands National Park was spectacular. Um, here's a live gray partridge, my lifer. Um, and uh, you can see that the habitat was similar to the habitat where uh, I showed you the deceased bird earlier. Um, uh, but I did over the next couple of days see, I think four or five of these birds, including uh, a couple of birds that um, Diana and I spotted at uh, the home of a, a, a rancher or farmer um, within the park. So Grasslands National Park is uh, about 350 square miles of mostly prairie grassland habitat. And uh, you can see this list here of the birds that I added uh, on my trip. Um, the aforementioned um, uh, provincial bird of Saskatchewan, the sharp-tailed grouse. Uh, upland sandpiper had a couple of uh, upland sandpipers first thing in the morning. Uh, a, a really cooperative um, American bittern that um, 
pumped for probably 20 to 30 minutes uh, in one area of the park, actually not too far from where I found the uh, sandpipers. Uh, started to see common nighthawk uh, on this day and would see that regularly for the next several days. Uh, saw first golden eagle, um, brewer's sparrow, uh, lark sparrow, vesper sparrow, and uh, baird sparrow were all new to the trip. And you can see the, the uh, uh, blackbird species were uh, quite numerous. I, I kept seeing all those birds, of course, uh, being in that uh, beautiful grassland habitat. Um, they were uh, typically abundant. So here's a photo of a sharp-tailed grouse early in the morning, kind of going through some tall grasses. That small um, bill and that kind of cryptic uh, uh, pattern on its back. Uh, I mentioned the nighthawks. Um, I saw, we, we both saw many in flight, but we all saw several, also saw several snoozing nighthawks. Uh, this one was on um, a, a fence post uh, just off a, a parking area. And I think there were two actually in the same area. Uh, here's a shot of a Vesper Sparrow. And I love this photo for the fact that it, it shows what for me are the, uh, are the uh, identifying features of this uh, sparrow, that white eye ring, the uh, white outer tail retrices, and the that um, rusty brown shoulder patch, which uh, shows up in breeding plumage. Um, uh, just a, a very cool bird. This Baird sparrow is uh, um, in the uh, in the family Centinix, which is uh, it, it shares um, that family with another bird here in the east, our uh, Henzo sparrow, uh, and you can tell that. Uh, it looks very similar to the, the Henslow's, but its face is uh, not quite as green and it has less um, rust color in the, the sides and back of, on the wings in the back. Um, and it has a more than a two fifths second long song. So it's not really quite like the Henslow's, but uh, Barrett Sparrow was a life bird for me. And um, it was really nice being on territory and seeing several of these birds while I was there. Here's a, a shot of one of the upland sandpipers that I saw. You could see that early morning light um, making the, this bird appear much, much brighter than, than I normally associate um, uh, these, uh, these uppies looking. Here's that bittern that it sat up on a sort of a patch of grass, um, really didn't do a lot to hide there. Um, um, you know, it, it probably had arrived uh, on territory within the last week or two. Um, so it was, it was calling um, uh, pretty regularly, as I said, uh, while I was um, birding along a stretch of two or three tenths of a mile, each uh, stop that I made, and I probably made several, three, four stops in this one uh, area because of some um, marshlands, obviously. Um, it, it was it was pumping the the entire time I could hear it um, for uh, over half an hour. So then on day ten we made our way to uh, old man on his back, uh, another just gorgeous uh, grassland habitat, thirteen thousand acres, um, donated by ranchers in the early nineties and uh, has grown in size. And uh, while, while Diane and I were there, there was an office, but um, the property now has an interpretive center. And we saw many of the same birds that I saw both in um, uh, Shul and Pawnee National Grasslands, as well as the Grasslands National Park in Saskatchewan. We saw, the, uh, we saw good numbers of um, uh, chestnut collar long spurs, uh, many of the sparrows, the blackbirds. Uh, it, it was uh, just beautiful habitat. The only new bird that I added to my list at this property was a prairie falcon. Uh, but this was our, our really our last day of birding. And we put a lot of miles on the car and seen some just beautiful uh, prairie grassland habitat. Here's a photo that uh, we, we 
uh, we found this uh, Swainson's hawk at, um, at a crossroads. Uh, this bird was um, within 20 feet of the road and despite uh, pulling up uh, within 40 feet of the bird, it, it never moved and uh, allowed for this uh, wonderful shot. Uh, we got back on that, uh, on that 10th day. I, uh, <clears throat> I actually, I, 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 that's not true. We, we got back on day 11 and, uh, I, uh, I grabbed, uh, some things and I, I left that same, that same day. I think I, if I recall correctly. Um, so I got on the road and, um, I was determined to head toward, uh, Manitoba because I wanted to add some species to my list. And some of you who, who bird uh, by car and, and take some of these trips know that it's really fun to, you know, start a list, a brand new list in a new state, or in this case, a new province. And so I could have dropped down back into Montana and started my way back west, but I, I really wanted to start a Manitoba list. So I added 20 species to my Manitoba list, including pelican and the yellow-headed blackbird, but I didn't get any new trip birds. Uh, and I arrived back in Ohio on June 2nd. So here's a couple of, uh, uh, of, of pointers of, uh, uh, of my trip. Uh, I traveled 4,500 miles over 13 days. I averaged 350 miles a day. Uh, you know, for trips like this, um, well, even for trips like this, 350 miles average per day is a lot of miles, but driving, to these birding locations afforded me um, experiences that I just could not have had if I had flown out to Colorado and then flown up to Regina and then flown home. Um, I spent so many days in some of these large, um, healthy grasslands. And to me, there was something that was just restorative about that process. Uh, I visited two new provinces. I had never been to Saskatchewan or Manitoba. And for the entire trip, I had a, a list of 133 species. And I had 35 species to my Canada list. Out of the 72 birds that I saw in Canada, 35 of them were life birds. And uh, I'm sorry, were uh, Canadian life birds. First, first time I'd seen in Canada. Um, the life birds that I got on the trip True light birds, which I'd never seen before at all, were the warbler, the golden crown warbler, the two long spurs, the Baird sparrow, and that uh, gray partridge. So that's my presentation. Uh, I'll be glad to uh, answer any questions. Thank you so much, Tim. This was delightful. And I want to go. Um, my question, I'm going to ask it first. Did you ever see a badger? Oh, thanks for reminding me. No, we saw so many badger dens and we, uh, we stopped to talk with, oh, probably a half dozen ranch owners. Uh, it was, um, I, I, I was really impressed with my friend Diana's ability to strike up conversations with these ranch owners and, and their thoughts on, their thoughts, oh, there she is, hi. Uh, uh, their thoughts on um, the um, challenges of having badgers on their property varied. They were, there was a spectrum. It seemed to me that, um, some of these ranch owners were really anti-badger. They worried, of course, about their herds, um, you know, slipping into the badger dens and, and being harmed. Um, and uh, there were other reasons why they didn't like it. And then there were other ranchers who seemed to me to be very open to having them there, recognizing that they were part of the landscape, part of the natural world that, that their ranches um, sat upon. So, and um, I will mention that um, my very, very good friend Diana is um, now on, I guess you joined during the, the program, but um, uh, she has joined us. And uh, uh, if anyone has any more specific questions about badgers, 
I will gladly direct them to Diana. But yeah, we never did see a badger on that trip, although we tried mightily hard. Oh, that's too bad, but well, and hi, Diana. All right, a couple of questions have come in on the chat. Um, uh, did, did you make accommodations ahead of time or uh, a day at a time? How did you get from place to place and did you get online or how did you work that out? Yeah, it was a, a bit of mix and match. Um, thankfully, Diana made our, our reservations well ahead of time in Saskatchewan. On my trip, I made the reservations for my lodge outside of Rocky Mountain National Park um, ahead of time. Uh, otherwise, I made them day of. Rocky Mountain National Park, I, I wanted to be very, very close to the park. And so I, I made those reservations ahead of time. But the, um, but the other reservations I, I made day to day. And, um, you know, often as I approached a city where I decided that I was going to stay, I'd, I'd get online, find something, um, typically a, a, a hotel or motel, and, um, and stay that way. So yeah, it was a little bit, bit of mix and match. Okay. Well, this kind of follows along um, a question about, did you have to make a reservation uh, to enter Rocky Mountain National Park? Not necessarily the lodge, but, but coming into the park itself. Well, that, that's a really great question now. Uh, it wasn't an issue back in 2018, but now as many of you know, I think, um, most if not all of the very popular parks now require some sort of reservation. They didn't back then. Uh, and um, my wife and I will actually be driving out to Colorado to Rocky Mountain National Park this summer. And so this is a, uh, this is a concern of mine as I'll have, I have not yet made those reservations and I'll need to do that, I think uh, later this month. Cool. Um, if folks want to unmute and ask questions, um, I know, let's see, oh, uh, Paula suggests make it at least three days ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. Questions out there? Several thank yous coming in. Wonderful. Um, any other large mammals that you saw? No grizzlies, no mountain lions. Um, no, you have the elk, no, which is cool. Yeah, we. I mean, I, 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 we saw. Well, I saw mule deer in. I think we, we, we saw mule deer in Grasslands National Park for sure, um, and I had seen mule deer in um, Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, certainly saw pronghorn, antelope, um, uh, just north of the Rockies. Uh, I can't remember, Diane, if you and I saw pronghorn anywhere. I'm. I'm thinking we did somewhere, but I, I, I don't don't recall specifically. But so pronghorn for sure. Unfortunately, no bears. It would have been just wonderful to see see bears in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, there were likely other smaller mammals that I'm not I'm not recalling right now. Uh, somebody mentions that it brought back good memories. Oh, Marianne Romito, yeah, who had who had ended out west uh, a couple years ago as well, too. Uh, oh, um, Craig is asking, are you a mountain plover at uh, at Pawnee Grasslands? I I wish I wish <laughs> no no mountain plovers. Ah. Um, yeah, I've, I've I've looked for them in Colorado, but uh, only ever seen them in California. So. A nice thought. <laughs> I know when I was out in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, we had the Williamson sapsucker. Did you uh, see those? Didn't see William sapsucker on this trip. I have seen it there uh, on previous trips. Yeah, blew my mind. The male <laughs> and the female look so different, and you're like, whoa! It was supposed to be a sparrow trip, but I was looking at everything. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, at at the higher elevations, that while well, I was. Rocky Mountain. Actually, the day I was there was the first day they opened the road uh, up to the, the higher elevations that were accessible in the park. Uh, because of the, the heavy snowfall that spring, the, the, the snowpack there, um, they, they didn't open that road until very late May. And so um, uh, I was hoping to see um, 
the uh, the ptarmigan, the white-tailed ptarmigan. I did not see that bird. Uh, the other bird that I had very much hoped for seeing, because I haven't seen it in so many years, was a uh, Clark's nutcracker, another uh, a large uh, bird of the higher elevations in uh, the Rocky Mountain National Park that uh, is not as common as, say, the Stellar's Jay, which are seemingly everywhere, but uh, didn't see a uh, Clark's Nutcracker. So seemingly these trips are all filled with the birds you saw and the birds you didn't see. Yeah, well, you'll, you'll be back to see them now. Or yes, this coming yes. summer, right? Yeah. Yeah, good. Fantastic. Um, I don't see any other questions come in and we're just about out of time. So uh, again, Tim, thank you so much for your travel log, for your photos, for your uh, wonderful uh, taking us all out West and enjoying the scenery and, and everything and the, and the mammals too. Thanks so much. Have a good evening, everyone. Oh, I see some applause going on. Yay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, thanks, Nancy. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Okay. Good night. Bye, Bye Dana.